two murders are linked by unusual bullets. But linking them to the killers seems like a shot in the dark. A woman points the finger of blame at her killers. But catching them depends on a forensic technique that hasn't been invented yet. When detectives on the trail of cattle rustlers uncover what looks like serial murder, they call on forensics to help them round up their suspects. They say that a burden shared is a burden halved. But when partners team up for murder, the weight of their crime can drag them both down. The burden of proof is on forensics to capture partners in crime. Nobody should die that way. I've never seen anything that horrific. One of the duties of a pathologist is to determine the cause of death. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Veely now. Make sure to like and subscribe. November 19th, 1989. Around 11.30 p.m., on the mean streets of Trenton, New Jersey, a passerby discovered a brutal murder. The victim was 38-year-old Francis C. Bodner, a driver for Golden Cabs. All right, lab tech over here, please. Lab tech. Officers at the scene examined the victim's body and combed the taxi for clues. Along with the slugs, they recovered a small metal disc with a raised edge, almost like a miniature bottle cap. It was a puzzling find. Detective Lieutenant Michael Salvatore felt it held the key to solving this crime. Tell me about that case from last night. Because no one had ever seen that type of bullet before, that there was a possibility that the bullet had been um, uh, created by a, uh, uh, an enthusiast, someone who loads their own bullets at home. If that were true, the bullets would be almost impossible to trace. But Salvatore hadn't seen the last of them. Just four hours later, he was called to another murder scene. A second taxicab driver was shot dead. Willie Rogers, age 33, had been discovered in the taxi he drove for the Diamond Cab Company. What do we got, guys? Again, investigators recovered the same odd metal disc along with a spent bullet. There she is. That's what we and in both cases, witnesses reported seeing three black men in the taxi prior to the murder. The evidence technicians soon produced another clue a fingerprint lifted from the first taxi's front passenger side door. The Trenton Police Department's evidence lab transmitted the print to the National Fingerprint Database, a clearinghouse for fingerprint evidence from around the country. It would take some time before the results came back. And there was no guarantee the print on the cab belonged to the killer. The Mercer County Medical Examiner performed the autopsies later that day. Bodner and Rogers were both killed by a single shot to the back of the head, execution style. The executioners left behind little besides the unusual bullets. To solve the execution style murders, Trenton police had to rely on ballistic evidence taken from the crime scene. It's all they had. By 11 o'clock on the morning the drivers were killed, Trenton police had delivered the bullets to the New Jersey State Police Lab's Captain Mike Lysinger. The bullets perplexed him as much as they did Detective Salvatore, 
and Lysinger had been a ballistics expert for more than 20 years. His reference books show that the little metal cap was called a gas check. The gas check is very unusual because you never see this in commercial ammunition. This is the first time we have ever encountered a gas check as long as I've been in ballistics. This was something unique to us. A gas check is placed on the base of the bullet to keep it from melting and clogging the gun barrel with lead. Many people who make their own bullets use gas checks. But Lysinger could tell these bullets were commercially manufactured, though no American company made them. Now he had to determine what sort of gun fired them. Using the lab's stereo microscope, he identified the pattern of alternating grooves and the spaces between the grooves, or lands, left on the bullets as they sped through the gun barrel. These lands and grooves are a gun's class characteristics, and ballistics experts can use them to identify the type of weapon most likely to have left them on a bullet. Lysinger determined that the Trenton gas check bullets had a pattern of five lands and grooves with a twist to the right. He told Salvatore to look for a Taurus revolver, a Ruger revolver, or a Smith & Wesson. All of these were in common use among Trenton criminals. Any one of thousands of weapons could have left its mark on the bullets. Investigators didn't even know where to start looking. Before long, however, they got their first lead. In the early morning of November 27th, an anonymous caller told Trenton police that two of the gunmen were twins named Ron and John Allen. Later that same day, John Allen was picked up for smashing car windows during a street fight. Investigators had him brought up for an interview. John Allen said he had been with his twin Ron and their friend all evening the night the cabbies were killed. They had hung out at a couple of clubs until 3 a.m. Salvatore wasn't convinced, but without physical evidence tying John Allen to the killings, he had nothing. When John Allen's prints didn't match the one pulled from the taxi, detectives wondered about his brother. They pulled Ron Allen's prints from a previous arrest record. Trenton police compared Ron Allen's file print against the one left on the taxi. The point-by-point -point comparison was a match. Ron Allen had been in the murdered man's vehicle. That wasn't enough to prove he was the murderer. Taxis see dozens of fares each day, but the match told investigators they were on the right track. Police learned that the Allen brothers were Trenton locals who became involved with a rough and dangerous gang called the New York Boys. Turf was at a premium in the Big Apple, so the gangs there started colonizing New Jersey. The Allens were recruited. I mean, Chief Williams knew all Detectives about. continued to interview friends and enemies of the Allen brothers, and hoping to poke holes that. in their alibi, hoping for anything they could right. use. Um, can, right, can on the street, just about everybody knew what was going on, but uh, unfortunately, in uh, a lot of the homicide cases I've worked on, uh, people are very reluctant to come forward and give, uh, give that information up. The information they gathered continued to implicate the Allen brothers, but stopped short of being enough to arrest them. Then, on the evening of December 20th, 1989, one courageous eyewitness stepped forward. When police assured him that he'd be safe, he agreed to talk. He told police that he was parked directly behind the first victim's taxi during the crime. He saw Bodner shot from behind and heard the window shatter. Then he drove past the cab, fast, and saw three men going through Bodner's pockets. He identified Ron and John Allen 
as two of the three men he had seen in the cab that night. The dragnet was closing in on the Allen brothers. But a single fingerprint and a rushed eyewitness account might not be strong enough to win the maximum sentence for these alleged killers. Detectives still needed to find a way to use the killer's ammunition against them. That's what I'm talking about right here. The investigation into the gang-style murder of two Trenton taxi drivers was making slow progress. Police had a witness who could place the Allen brothers at the scene of one driver's murder. Now they had to place a gun in their hands. They got help from a police informant. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm talking about. You interested? He yeah. told police that the Allens had tried to sell him guns and ammunition several weeks back, and that the guns had two bodies on them, two murders. Let me think about that. He didn't buy them. All right. Think about it. Right. Think back to it. To prove the Allens' involvement, Detective Salvatore needed those guns. He sent the informant out to get them. The informant risked his life to do so. On vacation today. Within two days, uh, we received a phone call from the informant, and uh, he had the weapons. He turned over the two revolvers and a fistful of bullets that he had Definitely just purchased from the Allens. Our cabbies. We also have... Salvatore sent the guns to the ballistics lab to compare with the slugs recovered from the taxis. It's the same class Both guns had five lands and grooves with a right-hand twist both could have fired the bullets found at the crime scenes. Another test would determine if one of them actually had. The guns were test fired. The marks on the test fired slugs from one of the guns matched the fatal slugs. Investigators had found the weapon they were looking for, the gun that killed Francis Bodner and Willie Rogers. Police obtained the warrants they needed to arrest Maybe the Allens. Officers swarmed over the places where they usually hung out. They found John Allen and brought him in. Ron Allen called Detective Salvatore a few hours later, asking about his twin. Detectives had the call traced. While I was uh, talking to Ron on the phone, we uh, had a couple teams out here in West Trenton, a couple detective teams poised in various locations out here because we knew this is where they, they uh, frequented and where he probably was. And as soon as we got the information from the, uh, the bell operator, we fed that information to our, uh, our units on the street and they uh, came here and they forced their way into the house and arrested Ron Allen, who was still on the phone with me at the time of the arrest. At first, Ron Allen denied everything. Then, no, investigators no. listed the evidence against him. Right. Tell me Allen gave it up for him, for his twin, and for a third man. Allen said on the night of the murder, he and his twin were out with a man named Greg Williams. He claimed Williams pulled the trigger. By 7 that evening, an arrest warrant had been issued for Williams. Five days later, authorities arrested him in Osceola, Georgia. But Salvatore was never convinced for a minute that Williams had been the trigger man. The weapon used in the murder of the two taxi drivers were guns owned by the Allen brothers. They were guns carried by the Allen brothers. They were guns held by the Allen brothers. So it was um, not likely that Gregory Williams possessed the gun and killed the cab drivers. We believe that it was the Allen brothers who killed them. On July 10th, 1990, Ronald and John Allen were convicted of the taxi cab murders. On August 16th, they were sentenced to two consecutive life terms. The Allen twins will be over 100 years old when they become eligible for parole. For his part in the crime, Greg Williams was sentenced to life as well. The Allen twins and Greg Williams killed two men 
for just over a hundred dollars. Money they intended to spend in New York City to buy drugs they could peddle in Trenton. In jail, the Allens bragged about robbing and killing the taxi drivers, saying they were easy targets. With ballistics evidence, so were the Allens. The Allen brothers found their victims on the streets. But staying at home doesn't necessarily mean staying safe. Los Angeles, April 17, 1991. On this morning, Marilyn Rush knew something was wrong when her friend Joan Dolly didn't show up for work. Joan was never late, and she wasn't answering her phone. Concerned, Marilyn drove to the house Joan shared with her husband, Dennis, to make sure she was all right. Even though Joan's car wasn't in the driveway, Marilyn went inside to check on her friend. She found her in the bedroom. Joan? 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 Oh, God. God. When the LAPD responded to the crime scene, it looked at first glance like a botched burglary. The bedroom had been ransacked. Joan Dolly's bruised hands told investigators that she had tried to defend herself. The Dolly's neighborhood had had a rash of break-ins, and this one matched the pattern. Outside, a screen had been removed from an open window, and a ladder stood beneath it. But as police worked the scene, they began to compile a growing list of clues that didn't fit with the burglary scenario. The damp ground under the window had no footprints or marks from the ladder. The windowsill, where the burglars allegedly climbed in, was clean of any dirt or scuff marks. Broken leaves, you know, pieces of leaves. And $100 was left in plain sight on the kitchen counter. It appeared as if someone had worked hard to make it look like Joan Dolly had interrupted a burglary. LAPD detective Paul Tippin wasn't convinced. All of these things together with the evidence at the supposedly the point of entry didn't add up. Initially, of course, you look at it as a burglary murder, but uh, uh, as it progressed, it turned out to be a fabricated crime scene, basically. Police suspected the murderer had contrived the scene after killing Dolly. Officers notified the victim's husband, Dennis Dolly, and asked him some routine questions. If you have that type of a murder, you're going to have to eliminate the uh, spouse. Well, you have to get over that hurdle before you can go to the next step. Dennis told police that he and Joan were high school sweethearts, married 35 years. He'd last spoken to his wife the night before. She was still asleep when he left the house at a quarter to five that morning for his job at the golf course. He had no idea what could have happened or who could have wanted his wife dead. He said he couldn't bear to stay in the house. If police had more questions, they could reach him at the home of his daughter, Debbie Myers. With Dennis Dolly above suspicion, Tippin pressed forward in his search for clues to this hideous murder. Now take that bag. The autopsy found that the victim had been killed by blunt force trauma to the back of her head. Tests turned up no evidence of sexual assault. The coroner discovered traces of blood and foreign matter under the victim's fingernails. But investigators had no certain way of telling whether it was the killers or the victims. In these early days of DNA technology, Accurate testing required large samples. 
testing the traces of material from under the victim's nails would jeopardize the sole piece of potential evidence. My first question was, do you think we can get DNA evidence from any evidence under her nails? And the answer was yes, but once we do it, then we may destroy all of the evidence through the analysis. So I was real reluctant at that time to do it. The risk was too great. Tippin would have to rely on old-fashioned detective work to solve this one, at least for now. Four days after the murder, Joan Dolly's missing car reappeared. Her son-in-law spotted it in a parking lot across the street from the card store where Joan had worked. Police found her keys, but no useful clues. Two days after the victim's funeral, Detective Tippin called Dolly at his daughter's house to see if he had noticed anything else the burglars may have taken. See you when I get back. But okay. Debbie Myers told Tippin that her father was gone. Dolly said that he needed to get away. He planned to spend a few days quietly fishing at Lake Mead. Myers told Tippin the name of the Las Vegas hotel where her father usually stayed. Tippin's experience told him it was strange for a man to leave town so soon after his wife's murder. He asked a pal in the Las Vegas Metro Police Department to keep an eye on Dolly. Tippin's Hello. opinion of the bereaved husband was about to change. The Joan Dolly murder investigation took a strange turn when Dennis Dolly turned up in a Vegas casino at 3.30 in the morning. He was in the company of a woman. Detective Tippin received surveillance photos of the pair. After checking around, the woman was identified as Brandita Taliano. The news didn't sit well. After I determined that he was in Las Vegas uh, with a female, um, two days after he had buried his uh, wife of 35 years, uh, I became very suspicious. Tippin looked into Taliano's background. He found that her rap sheet included convictions for prostitution and drugs. She had no fixed address. He also discovered that Taliano had been staying in the Mission Hills Motel in LA during the time of Joan Dolly's murder. The motel was just a quarter mile down the road from where Joan's car had been recovered. This was worth a closer look. So I went to uh... Uh, the Mission Hills Motel, uh, talked with the manager, and basically what happened was he gave me a list of phone calls and phone numbers going back a month. Tippin checked the list of Taliano's outgoing calls. She had phoned Dolly's home, the golf complex where he worked, and a local bowling alley that was his favorite hangout. Police Department, Miss Taliano? It was time to pay a call on Taliano. He traced her to a North Hollywood motel. Yes, ma'am, I'm Detective Tibben from the police department. I have a team Detectives approached Taliano and asked to search her room. Surprisingly, she agreed without blinking an eye. Generally speaking, I mean, if someone is that cooperative, they're not thinking that uh, they have anything that may develop into a lead or lead you to believe that they were involved in a homicide. The search turned up several pieces of jewelry. Most of it was junk. But one piece looked particularly valuable and not the kind of jewelry Taliano would normally own. Taliano had an explanation ready. She told them that she was often hired to clean the Dolly's house. While she was there, she took some jewelry, but not entirely without Dennis's knowledge. They were having an affair. She wanted us to believe that basically she was okay with being around Joan Dolly and Dennis. But Joan didn't know that 
the sexual activity was taking place. Detective Detectives found a note stating that Dennis was nervous about Taliano keeping the jewelry. He wanted her to fence it. That suggested he was involved in its theft. Very nice piece of jewelry here. A few days later, Debbie Myers identified the jewelry. She recognized the piece that her mother always wore. If that were true, then Taliano couldn't have stolen it from the victim's jewelry box. The other side. Jones' jewelry in Taliano's possession and a note linking Dolly to the stolen pieces. Too many coincidences were piling up too quickly. Perhaps their secret game didn't stop at theft. Once I identified uh, Brandita Taliano and the things that were going on uh, with her and Dennis Dolly, it became more and more apparent that it was a conspiracy and uh, that these two people were involved in the case. Investigators began to believe that Joan Dolly's murder was a crime motivated by love. Not Dennis and Brandita's love for each other, but their mutual adoration for money. If Dennis divorced his wife, he'd lose half of everything he owned. Plus, Joan had recently inherited close to $100,000. Police suspected that Dennis Dolly was a shifty and dangerous man. If he and Brandita had plotted to kill Joan because Dolly wanted all of her money, then why would he want to share it with Brandita? I was somewhat concerned about Brandita also in her situation because I thought the possibility was there that Dennis would murder Brandita just to get her out of the way. The evidence against the pair was only circumstantial. Investigators had no physical evidence putting them at the murder scene on the morning of April 17th. But they had enough to bring them in for questioning. At least then, authorities could keep their eyes on the pair. Based on what they had gathered so far, detectives developed a strategy. They had 48 hours to either charge them or let them go. It was a calculated risk. Tippin knew he didn't have the evidence to charge them. So he was gambling that once in custody, they'd crack and turn on each other. Dennis admitted to meeting Brandita Italiano on the street. And uh, basically that's all he would admit to was, yes, he was wrong and connecting up with Brandita and having her as a girlfriend, but as far as the murder or anything else, he was not involved in anything. Taliano told a different story. Hi, Ms. Taliano, how are you today? A few months before Joan's murder, Taliano had been serving time in a women's prison in Los Angeles. While visiting her there, Dolly had asked her a favor. Did she know anyone he could hire for a big job? She assumed that meant murdering his wife. Taliano recommended a man named Gary Ware. Dolly's deal with Ware must have been finalized while Taliano was in prison. She said Dolly never told her what happened. It was a hot lead. But investigators would need a lot more evidence to turn it into a murder charge that would stick. And Tippin's 48 hours were up. Authorities were forced to let Dolly and Taliano go. Ware was no choir boy. A man with a criminal record like his might be capable of committing murder for hire. His phone records showed that Dolly called him prior to Joan's death, but not afterward. All of a sudden, I have him right in the middle of this homicide with phone calls that are being directed to him by Dennis Dolly. So 
I had to find out why those calls were being made and what his participation or involvement was. How you doing? Hey, Gary Ware. How you doing? But a hardened criminal like Ware wouldn't just volunteer information to the police. Tippin spent a year trying to get him to talk. With his attorney present, Ware finally admitted to authorities that Dolly had contacted him with an interesting business proposition. The two agreed to meet. Dolly wanted Ware to kill his wife. He gave Ware $30,000 cash and told him he didn't care how Ware did it, but he wanted her gone. At first, Tippin couldn't understand why Ware would implicate himself in Joan Dolly's murder like this. As it turned out, he had an airtight alibi. On the morning the victim was murdered, he was in lockup at Chino State Prison. Tippin's most promising lead fizzled right before his eyes. After more than a year spent investigating Joan Dolly's murder, the case went cold. Though LAPD detectives had their suspicion, they still needed hard evidence placing Dennis Dolly and Brandita Taliano at the scene of the murder of Joan Dolly. One lead after another failed to pay off. Then, on the last day of February 1994, Detective Paul Tippin got a call that he'd been waiting three years for. In the time since Joan Dolly's murder, DNA analysis technology had been refined enormously. A new technique allowed even a tiny pinpoint of genetic material to be analyzed. Now, the lab could accurately test only a portion of the foreign matter found under the victim's nails without the risk of ruining the entire DNA sample. The lab's new testing technology, called PCR for polymerase chain reaction, encourages the DNA to carry out its natural function, continuous duplication, a carefully controlled environment of chemicals and heat works like a genetic copying machine. Colin Yamauchi is a criminalist with the LAPD Crime Lab DNA unit. We can start with a small sample and put it in this instrument that can make hundreds and then thousands and then hundreds of thousands and millions of copies of that same DNA. So it was kind of an exciting time in forensic serology when PCR came online and we were able to utilize this technology. With PCR, an immeasurable amount of DNA can be cultivated into a testable sample. The procedure was performed on a portion of material taken from beneath Joan Dolly's fingernails, then compared with DNA from her blood. It didn't match someone else's cells were under Joan Dolly's nails. And that meant that the possibility of a suspect's DNA was there. And that was very, very important to me because now it, it, it brought about a, a situation where I could maybe directly connect a suspect to the victim. And that was very, very important. Dennis Dolly's genetic material was tested against the sample from his wife's nails. It came back negative. By this time, Brandita Taliano was in prison for an unrelated crime. A warrant was issued and a blood sample obtained. This time, Tippin got his match. Now there could be no doubt. Brandita Taliano murdered Joan Dolly. But Tippin still wasn't convinced that Taliano had acted alone. Dennis Dolly's knowledge of the stolen jewelry, his attempt to hire a hitman, and a long string of incriminating phone records before the crime implicated him in the murder. I believe truly that they were both in it, they were both involved in it, they were both there when it happened. The jury agreed that Dennis Dolly and Brandita Taliano had conspired and murdered Joan Dolly. Nearly four years after her death, her killers were sentenced to 25 years to life. 
Dolly and Taliano believed that murder was the easy way to wealth. Unfortunately, they weren't the only ones to feel that way. Some people make murder a part of their business plan. Livingston County, North Central Missouri. Over a hundred years ago, this was wild, rough country under the rule of frontier justice. Today, it has settled into the essence of rural America. Old style towns surrounded by farmland. A place where farmers contend with the whims of the weather and the realities of economics. People here believe in an honest wage for honest work. At least most of them believe that. In October 1986, the Livingston County Sheriff's Department received a call from a nearby livestock auction company. A man named Dennis Murphy had passed a bad check for $6,000 to buy cattle. He had paid for the cattle, loaded them into a truck, and vanished. Though Murphy was a stranger, he appeared to be working with a local farmer named Ray Copeland. Ray had attended the auction, and while he hadn't bought any livestock, he provided a truck for the cattle Murphy had bought. Sheriff Gary Calvert paid Mr. Copeland a visit to find out more about Murphy. He admitted that he knew Dennis Murphy, that uh, Dennis had rented his pasture to keep those cows, and that he in fact had uh, sold some cows to Dennis himself and that Dennis had gave, gave him a bad check also. It might have been the end of the story, except that a month later, Calvert received another call about a drifter passing bad checks for about $6,000 worth of livestock. The drifter resold the cows, took the cash, and disappeared. Again, Ray Copeland had been at the auction, and it was his truck that carted the cattle away. But once again, Copeland said he was a victim too. Before, you, you did five of them already. And While that may have been true, Calvert had reasons for doubt. Ray Copeland had been arrested several times for passing bad checks of his own. Still, Calvert had no proof that he was behind this. Both of the cattle thieves had arrest records, consistently bouncing in and out of jail on minor charges. Calvert assumed they were bound to get arrested again He'd catch up with them soon enough. All he had to do was wait. Two years passed without any more trouble. Then, in October 1988, Calvert learned about three more drifters passing bad paper for good cattle. This wasn't the kind of crime Calvert had seen a lot of. Now he'd seen five cases in 24 months they had to be related. When Calvert ran a check on the two men who'd stolen the cows two years earlier, he found no record of them. They hadn't been arrested again anywhere. Calvert couldn't believe that these small-time criminals had reformed into model citizens, but he didn't know where they had gone or if Copeland might truly be involved. Calvert had heard rumors, though, Copeland's neighbors told him that he was hiring drifters from the local mission to help him at cattle auctions because he couldn't hear well anymore. Copeland supposedly promised to pay the men $50 a day to stay on his farm and not tell anyone they were there. Even if those rumors were true, they didn't mean much. A year passed before Calvert got more information and it wasn't what he expected. On August 20th, 1989, an anonymous caller to Nebraska's Crime Stoppers hotline tipped authorities to watch out for Ray and Faye Copeland of Mooresville, Missouri. The caller said that he had worked for the Copelands. Ray had made him buy cattle with bad checks and then threatened to kill him. He said he wasn't the first. He hinted that Ray was a murderer. 
Jack McCormick. On September 6th, 1989, just two weeks after the phone tip, the anonymous caller surfaced. Jack McCormick was picked up outside Salem, Oregon, for sleeping by the side of a highway. When the police computer revealed an outstanding warrant for bad checks in Missouri, he was extradited. When he got there, he admitted making the anonymous call. McCormick said that Copeland met him in a homeless shelter and hired him to work on his farm. After he moved into Copeland's house, Copeland opened a bank account for him so he could buy cattle. It seemed like a square deal, but McCormick grew suspicious when he found a closet full of men's clothes that belonged to other men from the shelter. Some had their names written inside, a common practice among drifters. During the 15 days he lived at the farm, McCormick said he made several cattle purchases for Ray and Faye Copeland. Faye kept the books, but soon McCormick overdrew the bank account and the Sullivan County Sheriff issued a warrant for his arrest. Right after that, on August 10, 1989, McCormick claimed that Copeland tried to kill him with a 22 rifle. Then, for some reason, Copeland changed his mind. McCormick fled the county. It sounded like a wild story, but the sheriff couldn't dismiss it out of hand. Then came the wildest accusation of all. McCormick said he found a human skull and leg bone on Copeland's farm. When he suggested that what might be happening here is that Mr. Copeland may be killing people, we thought we'd better look into it. Based on what McCormick told authorities, and coupled with the fact that two of the cattle thieves were seen with Ray Copeland, the sheriff had enough to arrest Ray and his wife, Faye, for charges relating to check fraud. A search warrant was issued to determine if they were up to something far worse. A drifter named Jack McCormick accused Ray and Faye Copeland of murder. He said the evidence was buried on their farm. On October 9, 1989, the couple was taken into custody. With the Copelands behind bars at the Livingston County Jail, the officers searched the farmhouse. They found items that seemed to substantiate Jack McCormick's account. Once you go ahead and bag this rifle. First was the closet of men's clothes. Faye had been cutting them up to make a quilt. Some of the clothes had the names of the missing men in them, just as McCormick had described. The officers also found a list of men's names hidden in a camera case. It included the men who had passed bad checks. The ones who vanished had X's beside them. If McCormick was telling the truth and Copeland was a killer, Sheriff Calvert would have to find the bodies. But after a week of searching, the officers found no trace of the missing men. While the Copeland farm was being searched, TV stations began reporting on the case. Rancher Keith Albright saw the story and called the sheriff to report what he knew. Yeah, this is Mr. Albright out here on Alaskan Road. Albright had rented a farm just six miles from Copeland's. Ray had done some odd jobs for him. Albright told police that he had found some bones out in a field. At the time, he thought they were animal bones. Now, he wasn't so sure. 
Having found no bodies on Copeland's farm, police believe that Albright might be onto something. If Copeland were guilty, he wouldn't be careless enough to bury all his victims on his own land. They spread out to search Albright's farm. In the barn, they noticed that some areas of the dirt floor had been disturbed. They began to dig. By the end of the day, officers uncovered three bodies from shallow graves on Albright's property. Calls kept pouring into the sheriff's department, and they tracked down every promising lead. When people found out that we were suspicious of what he may have been doing, they became suspicious about everything that they had seen him doing. So we, got, we, we went on a lot of wild goose chases. All right, looks like we have something down here. Don't quite know what it when is. When the bodies started turning up, oh, Copeland, perhaps trying to minimize his involvement, began telling wild stories. He said he overheard some strangers talking about dumping a body down a neighbor's well. Sure enough, investigators found the body of one of the missing drifters. But the lie backfired. The discovery implicated Copeland even further. The search on that farm intensified and a fifth victim was excavated from beneath 2,000 bales of hay. Using dental records, the five men were positively identified a few weeks later. Among them was Dennis Murphy, pulled from his watery grave. It was a good start, but investigators needed forensic evidence to tie Copeland more directly to the murdered men. Calvert gathered the 22 rifle found in Copeland's house and a pile of 22 slugs recovered from the bodies and delivered them to the Missouri State Highway Patrol. The rifle was test fired in their crime lab. It would leave its unique set of markings on the slugs as they hurled down the barrel. A comparison microscope was used to compare the markings. On one side, the test-fired slug. On the other, a slug pulled from one of the five murder victims. The marks on the slugs lined up exactly. To firearms and ballistics expert Todd Garrison, that meant only one thing. After comparison and examinations, we could conclusively say this particular bullet had been fired from this particular Marlin firearm obtained from the Copeland farm. Bullets from the same rifle killed each of the five victims. But investigators still needed to know if Faye Copeland had any role in this. The note found in the Copeland's house told volumes. Ray, who was illiterate, couldn't have written the names on the list. To see if she was the author, Calvert turned the list over to Missouri State Highway Patrol's handwriting section. Though a person's handwriting varies, certain features remain consistent. Handwriting expert Don Lott compared the note against a known sample of Fay's handwriting. He noted several distinctive characteristics. For example, the letter B always appeared in uppercase, even in the middle of a word. Locke concluded that this and other details were common to the note and to examples of Faye's handwriting. But what about the X's? It was possible that Faye had simply written the list of names and Ray had placed the X's by them as he killed the men. That would be harder to judge. Could one simply look at the X's and positively identify those X's to someone? No. But they were there, and as I said, they were consistent with the writing that was positively identified. Locke even compared the ink used to write the names against the ink used to write the X's. His conclusion? The same ink had been used for both. Faye Copeland 
wrote the names and marked the X's as her husband killed the men one by one. Locke and Garrison provided the forensic evidence to charge the Copelands with five counts of first-degree murder. On November 12, 1990, Faye was sentenced to death. Ray followed her on May 22, 1991. For two years, Faye and Ray Copeland were the only couple on death row sentenced for the same crime. Ray Copeland cheated the executioner when he died in October 1993 at the Potosi Correctional Center. In 1999, his wife of over 50 years had her sentence reduced to life. Though neither of the Copelands ever confessed, investigators pieced together this scenario. Ray somehow came up with the idea of hiring drifters to write the checks for him. Make sure that gate is locked. Yeah, the gate, the gate, got the gate. Come on. After the men outlived their usefulness, or when the warrants for passing bad checks piled up, there you go. Copeland murdered them. And Faye kept the books. How much is a human life worth? Police estimated that the Copelands made $30,000 from their scheme. $6,000 a victim. They thought no one would notice a few missing drifters. They were wrong. It's often said that two heads are better than one. When committing murder, having a partner gives police twice as much evidence to gather and twice as much chance to catch the killers. Investigators grapple with the case of a sexual sadist who's leaving behind painfully few clues. Even his victim is anonymous. When a woman steps out of her house and vanishes, Detectives find evidence that she's never coming back. With no body, no witnesses, and scant clues, the truth about her fate hangs by a hair. A hideous crime comes to light in a remote river, but all evidence has been washed clean. Investigators have no hope of solving it unless the murderer strikes again. Greed, rage, and revenge provide most killers motivation, but some hunt just for sport. To catch these murderers, investigators must follow a trail of scattered clues. Beneath the gaze of California's Sierra Nevada mountains lies the resort community of Lake Tahoe. Clean air and majestic forests instill a sense of harmony. But for one lost traveler, this was the cruelest place on earth. On September 17, 1987, investigators from the El Dorado County Sheriff's Department were called to an isolated spot off the side of an abandoned service road. The young woman had been gagged with a scrap of pantyhose. Investigators found what they believed to be the murder weapon, a strangulation device made from a tree branch and a shred of the victim's clothing that appeared cut with scissors. Unlike a rope or bare hands, a garrote is primarily used for torture. 
the killer went to a good deal of trouble to find a place to stage his lengthy assault. Sergeant Jim Watson was surprised to find a body in such a remote spot. And at that point, it was just a big question mark in my mind. How did she get here? Where did she come from? A lot of unanswered questions at that point, and, but it was where we started. What they did know was that the killer must have picked this location ahead of time. The remote service road was hard to find, not a place one simply stumbled upon. And it wasn't chosen merely as a place to dump a body. The path was too steep for carrying the victim. The absence of injury to the soles of her feet told detectives that her shoes weren't removed until she was walked down here. Working outward in a spiral pattern, they scoured the ground for additional clues. We began a sweep of the entire area from here up to the highway, which is about a third of a mile. That sweep revealed pieces of clothing that were scattered on various bushes and trees from here up to the main highway. Technicians collected what they believed to be the remains of the victim's outfit, a dress, a pair of underwear, a single shoe, and pantyhose remnants. Not knowing what might be of use later, they also collected a pack of cigarettes and a butane lighter. Some white cord found nearby suggested that the killer restrained his victim before he killed her. Detectives had no clue to the victim's identity, nor any solid leads on her killer. They hoped the medical examiner would give them something they could use. The post-mortem examination placed her between the ages of 16 and 21, she had a large contusion on her head, but that wasn't the fatal injury. The ligature around her neck had entered her life. Based on the amount of decay, the medical examiner estimated that she had died two to four weeks earlier. No tissue was found under her fingernails. No foreign fluids were found on her body. Technicians used sticky tape to pick up trace fibers from textiles. They processed every square inch of the victim's clothing and cataloged each shred in the hopes that one day they'd find a source of comparison. But without a suspect, this trace evidence was useless. And until they could identify the victim, the murder investigation was at a standstill. A sadistic predator was free to roam and to kill again. Detectives scoured hundreds of missing persons records, but to no avail. The papers published an artist's rendering of the dead woman. Tips poured in from families and friends searching for missing teenage girls. One by one, each was eliminated. There was nothing to do but wait. As months passed, the missing person search gradually spread up the coast. It wasn't until four months later, in January 1988, that police got a call from a Seattle woman who recognized the girl. Dental records finally gave the victim a name. 17-year-old Darcy Frackenpole was a runaway from Seattle who tried to build a life in Sacramento. She ended up working as a prostitute. Friends last saw her on August 24th, three weeks before her body was found. For a predator looking to kill, prostitutes make easy targets. Night after night, they let strangers drive them into the darkness. Sometimes they don't come back. Investigators looked for similar attacks on prostitutes in the Sacramento area. One caught their attention. 
Three days before Darcy's body was found, another prostitute had a brutal run-in with a customer. While leaning over to lock the door, the man grabbed her wrists and attempted to handcuff her. But before he managed to subdue her, a police officer cruising in the neighborhood noticed the struggling couple and interceded. After the prostitute escaped from the car, the perpetrator tried to bolt, but he was caught. One good look at a bag found on his back seat told police that the prostitute had gotten away just in time. It contained a pair of scissors, handcuffs, and a garrote assembled from two wooden dowels and a length of white cord. It seemed to be some sort of crime kit. Police arrested the suspect, 48-year-old Roger Kibbe. A furniture maker by trade, Kibbe had a burglary record that spanned two decades. Illiterate but intelligent, acquaintances described him as a quiet man who liked to take long drives at night. He was given an eight-month sentence for assaulting the prostitute. While he was in prison, Darcy Frackenpole had been identified in Lake Tahoe, over 80 miles away, and the hunt was on for her killer. Kibbe's attack on the prostitute in Sacramento and his crime kit gave investigators the haunting suspicion that this wasn't his first strike. They didn't know how many women had made the mistake of climbing into Kibby's passenger seat. They wondered if Frackenpole was one of them. A garrote is an unusual and memorable weapon. Though the one found in Kibby's crime kit didn't resemble the makeshift device used to kill Frackenpole, the white cord used in its construction resembled the rope found at her murder scene. And like his assault victim in Sacramento, Frackenpole was a prostitute. Investigators questioned him, hoping that he would incriminate himself in the Frackenpole murder. He denied any involvement. Detective suspicions were purely circumstantial. The only thing they had to go on was the nylon cord. It deserved a closer look. Under the magnification of a stereo microscope, Technicians compared the cord samples from both Frackenpole's murder scene and Kibbe's car. Both strands contained the same number of fibers made up of the same weave and pattern. Investigators discovered that this wasn't just household rope. It was parachute cord. They learned that Kibbe worked at a storage facility and rented a unit there. They obtained a warrant to search it. Oh yeah, right there. It's a skydiving certificate for Roger. They learned that he enjoyed skydiving, and when they removed a photograph from the wall, they made an unexpected discovery. The picture was hanging from a length of parachute cord, exactly like that found at both crime scenes. But it was hardly a smoking gun. Investigators found nothing to definitively link Kibbe to the death of Darcy Frackenpole. This relatively common rope would not support the weight of a murder investigation. Unless they found more evidence, Kibbe would be out of prison in just a few months and then would probably disappear. But tiny fibers might prove stronger than sturdy cord. Now that investigators had a suspect, they could compare the trace evidence originally collected from Frackenpole's clothing to fibers collected from Kibbe. There are many serial type crimes that we don't have blood analysis or DNA analysis. And if there's not bullets or blood or semen, we have no other option other than to look at the particulate or the trace evidence. At the California Department of Justice Crime Lab, criminalist Faye Springer scrutinized the numerous fiber lifts taken from Darcy Frackenpole's clothing. Hours can be spent analyzing one square inch. After three weeks, 
poring over the evidence, Springer found two fibers that stood out because of their larger size. The distinct shape and color of the fibers cross-section told her that they were fibers from a blue nylon carpet. Here's where her 30 years experience paid off. She asked investigators to find out what kind of car Kibby had been driving at the time of the assault. A search warrant was executed and the suspect's car was taken in for inspection. Springer was on target. The floor mats were blue. What's more, one had a red stain on it. A sample was collected and sent for testing. The results were disappointing. It turned out to be pink. But the blue fibers from Kibby's car still had forensic value. A sample was compared with the fibers found on the victim's clothing. Not only were the shape and composition of the strands the same, a spectral dye analysis confirmed that they were exactly the same color. Was this proof that Darcy Frackenpole was in Kibby's vehicle? Not quite. The same blue carpeting could be found in tens of thousands of vehicles. If investigators were going to catch Kibby, they'd need something more conclusive. But one strange similarity couldn't be accounted for. Both the fibers from the car and the ones from the victim's clothing were peppered with tiny football-shaped specks. Samples of both were sent to a lab in Chicago that specializes in identifying microscopic contaminants. Until the results came back, investigators had no other evidence beside the parachute cord. As they began their careful scrutiny for something they might have overlooked, they realized that Kibby might have left behind just enough rope to hang himself. In California, criminalist Faye Springer was trying to use three lengths of rope to lasso a killer. She examined the ropes under higher and higher magnification until she noticed something strange. The rope found at the Darcy Frackenpole murder scene had tiny red paint flecks in it. So did the cord from the garrot found in Roger Kibbe's car. So did the sample from his storage unit. Spectral analysis showed that the paint on the three cords had the same chemical composition, including some microscopic black specks that must have gotten trapped beneath the drying paint. It was a powerful connection. So it looked like not only did we have the same kind of cordage, but we had uh, cordage that lived or existed in the same environment, was exposed to the same kind of contaminants. For all intents and purposes, it was the same rope. But investigators needed more to tie up their case. That's when the call came from the testing lab in Chicago. They had finished analyzing the carpet fibers. The unidentified football shapes found on the carpet fibers were fungal spores, single-celled organisms that could have come from dirt or mold. But there was something else. The lab's powerful microscopes had identified a red spot on the carpet fiber found on the victim's clothes. It was paint. It had the same properties as the paint on the floor mat of Kibby's car. The carpet fibers weren't just similar. They were identical. Both contained the same football-shaped fungal spores and the same paint stains. The victim and suspect had now been irrefutably linked. Well, what about the other one there? Roger Kibbe was arrested on April 25, 1988, for the murder of Darcy Frackenpole. By trial time, police had pieced together the details of the victim's last night. She had been working the streets, when she accepted an invitation that would turn out to be a date with death. Investigators suspect that after restraining her with the parachute cord, Kibby brought her to a place he'd selected in advance. After cutting up her clothing and torturing her for several hours, he killed her, then scattered her clothes. Roger Kibby was found guilty of murder in the first degree and sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. No one knows how many other victims met a fate similar to Darcy Frackenpole's. 
At least three other murders matching Roger Kibbe's M.O. are thought to be his work. Had it not been for a powerful microscope and some shrewd detective work, the number might still be rising. Roger Kibbe had covered his tracks by heading out in search of strangers, but not all predators hunt far from home. On a brisk October morning in 1992, neighbors saw Laura Hoteling leave the Bethesda, Maryland home that she shared with her mother. The 24-year-old Harvard graduate moved back after college and had no trouble finding a job at a consulting firm. But on this day, she never made it to work. A close friend and colleague went to check on her. Though the back door was open, she found the house empty. Anyone home? Laura? Laura? Someone didn't come to work today. There was no sign of Laura, nor any hint about where she'd gone. Laura, I know you're here. She contacted Laura's family, concerned that there was some sort of emergency. They were as puzzled as her friend. Laura's mother cut her business trip short. Neither she nor her son had any idea where Laura could be. She was not the type to run off without leaving word. Serious about her career, Laura was known for her diligence and punctuality. No burdensome secret seemed to be weighing on her mind. She didn't hint about leaving town. Her family filed a missing persons report with the Montgomery County Police. At this point, all Detective Ed Tarney could do was a routine check. We checked with the friends. They had not heard from her. She did not leave a note. It was just very suspicious. We also, uh, through the course of the investigation, we checked all her credit cards, bank accounts. There had been no activity. But as missing persons cases go, this was in its infancy. It had only been a few days since Laura Hoteling was last seen. Though there had been no sign of her, there hadn't been any indication of foul play either. Hey, how's it going, pal? Good. Police Good. interviewed the Hotelings' friends, Sorry. their neighbors, their gardener. No one could offer any information regarding yeah. the woman's disappearance. Yeah. But, uh, her no, no, After I'm seeing her leave for work the previous morning, there'd been no sign of Laura, nor any indication of trouble at her house. But then, as they searched the woods around the house, investigators found something that told them this was more than a missing persons case. The pillowcase and pillow inside it were stained with what appeared to be blood. When we took the bloody pillowcase back to the house, it matched up with the other pillowcases that were there. And at that time, we were, uh, we knew we had something very, very serious. To find out more about the stains, investigators turned to forensic scientist Susan Ballou at the Montgomery County Crime Lab. I take the pillowcase off the pillow. Okay. Ballou Get first the pillow. tested the stains to confirm that they were made by human blood. We wanted to see if we could pick up a type consistent with Laura. We knew from her donations to the Red Cross facility that she was a type A blood. The blood stain from the pillow was shown to be of the same type. From its bright red color, Baloo knew that she was looking at stains less than a week old. Though her findings could only prove that someone with type A blood had bled on Laura Hoteling's bedroom pillow, it was enough to turn the missing persons case into a potential homicide. Investigators needed to find out what had happened in Laura's room. 
Beneath the bedspread, they found something strange. There was a flat sheet on the bed, but the fitted sheet was gone. And on the mattress underneath were some faint stains that looked like more blood. Investigators saturated the mattress with a chemical called luminol. When it combines with blood proteins, even those invisible to the naked eye, it glows. Viewed in the dark, Laura's mattress radiated a pattern of blood spots and streaks that spelled murder. There was a large quantity of blood that showed up on that bed. That's when we knew uh, she was, had probably been murdered there in her bedroom. The lack of spatter on the surrounding walls or furniture told detectives that the killer had used the pillow to staunch the blood flow. The absence of a blood trail leading from the bedroom suggested that the killer had either cleaned his tracks or wrapped the body before removing it from the house. Investigators collected fibers and samples of Laura's hair in case they ever had the need to make a comparison. Meantime, technicians searched the pillowcase for any link to the suspect. A crucial detail surfaced. Based on the repeated pattern of triangular smears, they surmised that the killer had stabbed the victim with a narrow, pointed weapon, which was then wiped on the fabric. Hidden in the corner of the pillowcase, Baloo uncovered a more significant discovery. And when I looked at these areas closely, I could see partial impressions of prints on them, which turned out to be what's called a patent print, a print that is made in blood. However, there was not sufficient ridge detail to get enough information from it. In its current state, the print was too vague to be used for identification. But criminalists like Baloo have ways of turning faint prints into glaring evidence. She applied a protein-sensitive dye to enhance the pattern. We'll see what we can do with it. Now that they had a viable print, all they needed was a suspect. Mrs. Hodling couldn't think of anyone who would want to harm her daughter. She did recall, though, that their gardener, Haddon Clark, had been fascinated by Laura since his first day on the job. She also told police that she'd discovered her spare key was missing. Clark had worked for the family for several months. During the day, he was allowed in to use their bathroom or help himself to some coffee. Overnight, he lived out of a truck that he kept in a nearby church parking lot. Though Clark denied any knowledge of an attack on Laura Hoteling, his agitated behavior cast him in doubt. It wasn't Clark's first brush with the law. He had once been arrested on a burglary charge. When Clark's prints were compared against the patent print from the pillowcase, they matched. The suspicious gardener had left his print in wet blood on the victim's bedroom pillow. And the only way he could have done that, police contended, was if he had killed her. Though they still had no body, police arrested Clark on November 6, 1992. Inside his truck, along with his gardening tools, they found a hardware store receipt for carpenter's twine, duct tape, and plastic sheeting, ordinarily harmless materials that homicide investigators see more than their share of. Detectives believed that Clark was the killer. Proving it would be another matter. Despite the circumstantial evidence heaped against him, all police had was a bloody fingerprint. Clark's lawyers were already formulating their rebuttal. The homeless man regularly scavenged through trash in the woods. He could have easily left an innocent fingerprint on the pillowcase. It was up to the prosecution to prove otherwise. So at that point, we realized the fingerprint was not going to be the crux of this particular case, and we had to go further. Despite his dubious profile, detectives didn't have a single shred of physical evidence to tie Clark to the murder. And without a body, the case would be nearly impossible to prove. Investigators searched Clark's squalid campsite for a weapon, or even a body, but no weapons were found. 
and the only bodies were the game he trapped for food. Detectives began to scour the place for tinier clues to prove Laura had been there, but realized that finding anything of value in this hovel would be impossible. The trial date was just weeks away. If the prosecution failed to convince a jury of Clark's guilt, they wouldn't be able to try him again, even if the body turned up later. And without any convincing evidence, it seemed their case against the gardener would wither on the vine. The trial date was drawing near, and Maryland investigators needed to find some physical link between Haddon Clark and the victim, Laura Hodling. Because the victim's body hadn't been found, the case would have to hinge on other evidence. Investigators were at a loss to determine what that evidence might be. While they searched the suspect's belongings, forensic technician Susan Ballou continued processing the evidence from the crime scene. In preparation for any possible hair comparison, Ballou inspected more than 90 hairs taken from the victim's hairbrush and made a shocking discovery. When I started to do that, I noticed that one of the fibers I put under the microscope was a wig fiber. And it just jumps out at you. It is so different from an actual hair, and it caught me off guard. May I speak to Ed Tarney, please? Baloo learned that none of the victim's family or friends owned or wore wigs. From receipts found in Clark's truck, investigators learned of a storage facility that he rented in Rhode Island. Investigators realized that his penchant for dressing up might be the one thing that could finally expose him. If technicians could prove that the single wig fiber found in the victim's brush had come from one of the suspect's wigs, they would be able to show that he had been at the scene of the crime disguised. Baloo pulled sample hair fibers from each of the 24 wigs and compared them to the single wig fiber found in the victim's hairbrush. After looking at, under the microscope at all the different fibers from these wigs, I found one wig that the fiber from that wig had the same color composition, the same diameter. It also had the same internal characteristics as that one wig fiber that I recovered from that hairbrush. Now that Baloo had narrowed her search to one wig, she sent it with the original strand to a crime lab that specializes in hair testing. The last and most definitive test would compare the dyes in both samples. Though indistinguishable to the human eye, each wig manufactured in the U.S. has a unique fingerprint. Each of the approximately 7,000 commercial dyes is trademarked by the company that formulated it. The lab studied the samples under a microscope sensitive to ultraviolet rays. They called Baloo with their findings they were able to determine that that dye content in the wig, as well as that question fiber recovered from the brush, were in fact one and the same. Clark's defense attorneys couldn't get around this single strand of hair. Realizing he couldn't skirt the evidence, Clark confessed. He plea bargained to murder in the second degree. In exchange for the reduced charge, he agreed to reveal Laura Hoteling's grave located near his campsite. Clark admitted to having stabbed the victim with a pair of scissors. The autopsy concluded she was also suffocated. Ultimately, investigators pieced together her final hour. Driven by sick obsession, Clark learned that his victim would be alone while her mother was out of town. Using the spare key, he entered the house, smothered hoteling with a pillow, then stabbed her in the neck. Clark must have rolled the body in the missing bedsheet, then wrapped it with the plastic and tape he'd purchased from the hardware store. He loaded the body in the truck and drove to a clearing near his campsite, where a shallow grave awaited. 
The following morning, Clark returned to the scene of the crime to clean up and cover his tracks. He figured that by posing as Laura Hoteling, he'd throw any nosy neighbors off his track. His last look in the mirror would prove his undoing. Without the ironclad forensic case against him, Clark probably would have never confessed. His victim's body might still be lying in a lonely grave, and Haddon Clark might have extended his killing streak. Thankfully, the devious killer couldn't escape the evidence. He was sentenced to 30 years in prison. Please hurry, he's trying to kill me. There's no telling where a trail of evidence might lead. Sometimes investigators stumble onto more than they bargained for. At 4.30 a.m. on January 21st, 1995, the Marion County, Oregon police received a phone call from a prostitute named Lisa Louise Benson, who claimed to have been attacked. Benson was brought to the hospital for treatment. Lieutenant Bob Stye questioned her about the terrifying ordeal. She had ligature marks across her neck and um, also had an abrasion and the signs of bruising on the back of her neck and had abrasions um, um, on her hands and up on her knees. Her injuries were photographed as evidence. Earlier that morning, she told investigators, a customer had tried to kill her. She'd never seen the man before, but he didn't appear threatening. She climbed into his truck. He brought Benson to a retail carpet outlet. After roughing her up in an office, he forced her into the warehouse. He tied her to a forklift and told her she was going to die. And then hoisted her, literally hoisted uh, the lift up to where she was dangling with her feet about six or eight inches off the ground. She hung there for almost a minute. Then the rope broke and she fought her way free. The plastic wrap that bound her wrists was taken into evidence. Police learned from the carpet store manager that one employee, Larry Reed, fit the suspect's description. When Reed showed up to work the next day, police were there to meet him. He admitted that he'd picked up a hooker the night before, but when questioned about it, he became evasive and uncooperative. He refused to give any more information without an attorney present. Police heard all they needed. They arrested Reed for the attempted murder of Lisa Benson. A look into his background revealed a disturbing history of assaults on little girls and elderly women. He had been institutionalized more than once, but nothing, it seemed, could tame his instinct to prey on vulnerable females. Reed fit the profile of a sadistic sexual predator, but so far the case against him was based only on the word of a prostitute. To make the conviction stick, detectives needed physical evidence proving that he caused her injuries. They obtained a warrant to search the office where Benson claimed to have been attacked. They found blood spatter throughout the office. The pattern of droplets revealed repeated blows to the body, probably with a blunt instrument. The underside of the carpet disclosed two large blood stains, although the top of the carpet had been cleaned. Criminalists are often called on to build a case from a single drop of blood. In this case, however, they had copious amounts. They found more on the dashboard, glove compartment, and steering column of Reed's car. The evidence was sent to the lab. The results 
were anything but routine. Tests confirmed that all the samples were blood, but not a drop of it came from Lisa Benson. Investigators in Oregon faced an unnerving predicament. Their routine investigation into Lisa Benson's assault had exposed a much greater crime. Not only was Benson's blood a mismatch, the spatter and saturated carpet didn't correspond to her injuries. Forensics determined that the amount of bloodshed indicated that someone had been brutally murdered in the manager's office. Now they had a homicide investigation with no clues about the victim. They didn't even know when he or she was killed. They did, however, have a suspect, Larry Reed. His manager at the carpet warehouse told investigators that almost two months earlier, Reed had said he needed his carpet cleaned. Reed explained the situation to his boss. Mr. Reed had reported that a customer had come into the business during um, the evening hours of uh, December 7th, um, and that this person had complained about being sick and, and had gone into this office and had thrown up, and in throwing up, he had also thrown up some blood. The story was unlikely, but at least it gave investigators a time frame for the murder. A little research brought to light an unsolved murder in the next county. In December 1994, fishermen noticed something peculiar floating in the Santium River. Closer inspection revealed it was a body. They marked the location and contacted the sheriff's office. Investigators retrieved the nude body of a woman from the muddy water. Though the water had distorted her features beyond recognition, the numerous wounds to her head were plain to see. Someone had murdered this woman and dumped her body into the river. These murky depths, the killer hoped, would conspire to keep his secrets hidden forever. The medical examiner determined that the victim was around 40 years old. The degree of tissue decay and the amount of mud and algae coating the body told him that she'd been in the water for several weeks. Seven penetrating wounds had fractured her skull, inflicting fatal damage. From the size and magnitude of the wounds, the pathologist believed the murder weapon to be a tool with a hammerhead on one side and a cutting blade on the other. Identifying the victim would be a challenge. Because she had no fillings, there would be no dental records for comparison. And because of her time in the water, technicians were unable to render fingerprints by the standard inking method. But they had other ways. The hands were amputated according to standard scientific practice and sent to the police lab. There, highly detailed photographs of the fingertips were taken. These photographs were compared to a police database of fingerprints from women matching the victim's description. They came up with a match. The fingerprints belonged to Marjorie Lynn Sessions, a 38-year-old prostitute. Detectives from the Lynn County Sheriff's Office, which is south of us, advised that they were working a homicide case involving a woman named Margie Sessions. The detectives from Lynn County advised that um, Margie's lifestyle was one of uh, being involved with the methamphetamine use and uh, prostitution. December 7th, the same day that Reed reported the bloody carpet stain, was the day Marjorie Sessions had last been seen uh -huh. alive. Mm -hmm. Since both women were prostitutes, it appeared that his attack on Lisa Benson was part of his chilling pattern. And so it was those two significant um, facts that led detectives to um, kind of put the two cases together. 
only a DNA test could definitively link Reed to the murder of Marjorie Sessions. If the victim's DNA matched DNA taken from the blood found at the carpet warehouse, investigators would have their man. It wasn't so easy. The victim had been in the river so long that the water degraded the DNA in her blood. But there was one last chance. In March 1995, three months after her death, the victim's body was exhumed. Technicians extracted dental pulp and bone marrow. From these samples, they generated a DNA barcode. In order to confirm that the DNA had not been degraded, technicians compared it against tissue samples from the victim's parents. The genetic pattern was intact. When tested against the blood samples from the suspect's office, it matched the DNA pattern for every stain collected. The blood work proved that Marjorie Sessions had been wounded in Larry Reed's office and that the suspect had transferred some of the blood to the interior of his vehicle. But it couldn't prove for a fact that Larry Reed had killed her. The only way to do that would be to establish a relationship between the suspect and the dumping of the body. Before they could solve this case, investigators had one more river to cross. In order to prove that Larry Reed had murdered Marjorie Sessions, detectives needed to show that the suspect was responsible for disposing of her body in the river. Scouring police records for similar attacks in the area they made a crucial discovery. Back on December 7th, the day after Sessions was last seen alive, an illegal dumping report was filed in neighboring Polk County. Residents had reported a man fitting Reed's description, getting out of a pickup truck to dump trash along a roadside. Just make sure we get that tag. The bag, which bore traces of blood, contained blood-stained paper towels. Mixed among them was a single sheet of plastic shrink wrap. Nearby, investigators found a carpet remnant, also spotted with blood. They had no way to trace whose blood it was or who had dumped the trash there until now. Samples had been saved and were brought to the forensics lab. Each item was carefully studied. The single piece of plastic wrap was compared with the wrap collected from the Benson case. Criminalist Brad Putnam performed the analysis. The first thing we did was look at the class characteristics, the physical characteristics of the plastic. Is it clear? Is it colored? Is it uh, opaque? Can you see through it? Um, we took measurements of the thickness, of the width. Experts couldn't prove that the plastic wrap found at the dump site came from the same roll as the plastic used to gag Lisa Benson but they were able to prove that it was identical to the wrap found at the factory where Reed worked. It was of the exact same shape, width, and coloring. Now that was real significant for us because uh, we knew Mr. Reed worked as a carpet salesman. We also knew that at the carpet store, uh, he had used plastic shrink wrap on Miss Benson to put around her mouth and around, around her throat. And we had the same type of plastic wrap found at the illegal dump site. The blood found on the carpet and paper towels sealed Reed's fate. It matched the blood found in his office. It had come from Marjorie Sessions. Based solely on forensic evidence, detectives had pieced together the details of her murder, from initial contact to the time her body entered the water. Forensic supported witness statements from the unlawful dumping. Uh, it, uh, helped solidify some of the theories that may have been going on and really tied um, kind of a multi-jurisdictional nightmare into a nice tidy package for the prosecution. Police believe that on the night of December 7th, Reed picked up sessions at a bar. As he had done with Benson, he brought her back to his manager's office, where things turned violent. Repeated blows to her head ended her life.
Reed then dumped the body in the Santiam River. Even if she were eventually found, he thought, there would be no way to tie her to him. But Reed underestimated the power of forensics to draw a link with Marjorie Sessions, to coax DNA from the grave, and to turn flimsy bits of trash into an incontrovertible murder charge. Confronted with that much physical evidence, uh, it's pretty hard to deny involvement. Reed was sentenced to 40 years for the murder of Marjorie Sessions and the attack on Lisa Benson. Thanks to the forensics analysis, a case that seemed destined to go unsolved was proved beyond a shadow of a doubt. And a predator who may have gone on hunting for years was stopped in his tracks. Honing their skills with each attack, sadistic killers are some of the most difficult criminals to catch. Today, science is giving law enforcement the edge. With the use of advanced forensic techniques, investigators can build a solid case from the scattered clues they leave in their wake.